Santana stated, quote, I know it sounds new age, but in my meditation, this entity, which is called Metatron, he said, we want to hook you back to the radio airwave frequency. We want to reach junior high schools, high schools, and universities. Carlos Santana said that these spirits, which as we shall see in a little bit, were actually devils, had supernaturally brought different musicians to him and worked in the musical arena to bring them all together for this landside album appropriately called Supernatural. Santana said, I heard this entity wanted me to know I would be hooked up with the right writers, musicians, and producers for the purpose of reaching high school and college kids. So my inner instructions were clear. He said that Eric Clapton wanted to know if he could play on the album. He said all the people who played on the record said that they had heard my music before I called them or that I appeared to them in dreams or something. Santana said they knew what was coming before they got the call. Santana admits that he is channeling music from the same spirit entities that use Jimi Hendrix, who himself claimed to be demon-possessed. He said, quote, there is an invisible radio that Jimi Hendrix and Coltrane tuned into, and when you go there, you start channeling other music. Santana told Rolling Stone magazine, quote, you meditate and you got the candles, you got the incense, and you've been chanting, and all of a sudden you hear this voice, write this down. Santana described receiving information from the spirit world like a human fax machine. He sat me down and he told me that he had, he had done his meditations and that he had, he had spoken with his wife and, and that he had spoken with, with the angels and they had come to him and, and, and they had told him that this is what he needs to do. Santana's angels are really devils who are using Santana to communicate Satan's age-old lie that we are gods. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I want to I get tapped into what he's doing. That's... <laughs> and what you're going to see with regard to Jimi Hendrix is that not only did he admit to being demon-possessed, but he admitted that his music had just come out of him and that it affected other people because these demons were using his music. And Jimi Hendrix, even decades after uh, he died, Rolling Stone put him on the front cover of one of their magazines and touted him as the uh, greatest guitarist of all time. He's still regarded that way. And in VH1's countdown of best artists, he made the top five. But what you're about to see is that Jimi Hendrix was really not Jimi Hendrix. The power of Jimi Hendrix was a demon spirit, or more than one demon spirit, using him and channeling music through him, even as we saw earlier with Carlos Santana, who spoke of channeling the same music that Jimi Hendrix does. Let's check out this clip and see what happened in the 60s through music. Jimi Hendrix, who claimed to be a voodoo child, stated, quote, Things like witchcraft, which is a form of exploration and imagination have been banned by the establishment and called evil. It's because people are frightened to find out the full power of the mind. The satanic powers Hendrix unleashed through his music, though, were absolutely destructive. Jimi Hendrix opened himself up to demonic beings who used him to initiate the hippie youth into the counterculture revolution. Alan Douglas, the executive curator of Hendrix's musical estate, admitted his spirit possession. Now, one of the biggest things about Jimmy was what he believed, and he believed that he was possessed by some spirit, and I got to believe it myself, and that's what we had to deal with all the time, and he was very humble about discussing it with people because he didn't want people to feel like he was being uh, pretentious and so on, but he really believed it, right? and he was wrestling with it constantly. Jimi Hendrix's live-in girlfriend, Fane Pridgen also spoke of Hendrix's admission to being demon-possessed and related his demon possession to the reception of his music. He used to always talk about uh, some devil or something was in him, you know, and he didn't have any control over it. He didn't know what made him act the way he acted and what made him say the things he said and, and songs and different things like that just come out of him, you know. And But uh, at first I used to think it was a cop-out when he had really done me in, right? And uh, he'd say, I don't know what come over me, you know. I really can't understand it. And, you know, he used to just, you know, grab his hair or something or pull his hand or stand in the mirror or cry or something. Oh, Lord, it was so sad when he would cry. He was, maybe he was the first man or maybe the only man that I've ever seen cry, you know, but it just killed me when he cried because he felt like, it, I mean, it seems like to me he was so tormented and just torn apart and like he really was obsessed, you know, with something really evil, you know, and he said, you know, like you're from Georgia, you know, he said, I should know how, you know, people drive demons. He actually thought about, you know, if we ever go, because I used to talk about my grandmother and all her weird stuff, you know, and he used to talk about us going down there and uh, having some root lady or somebody see if she could drive this demon out of him. Make a whole lot of money. Gonna be big, yeah. 
Newsmaster B.B. King said, quote, as a musician, Robert Johnson had it all. I think he's the greatest uh, folk blues guitar player that ever lived, and the greatest singer, the greatest writer. You know, you, th you think you were getting a handle on playing the blues, and, and then to hear Johnson, you like, whoa, there's a long way to go yet. <laughs> uh, it's still the most powerful uh, cry that I think you can find in music of the human voice. Blues master and Johnson's mentor, Sun House, said of him before Johnson's transformation, he sat at our feet and played during the break and such another racket you've never heard. Sun House said he made the audiences mad with his racket. Sun House went on to say of Johnson before he made his alleged pact with Satan that he was a talentless and even an irritating guitar player. But he followed me and Willie around on Saturday night, yeah, Willie Brown. And every time we stop for rest and sit there, we we'll get the other over in the corner or something and go out to catch air, you know, get the guitar and be trying to play it and be just noising the people, you know. <laughs> and when the folks would come out, I'd say, why don't y'all, some of y'all go in and make that boy put that, get that thing down, he running us crazy. Finally, he left, he run off from his father and mother. And he went over in Arkansas or something. Well, he was gone about six to eight months. It was during this period of six to eight months that it is said that he made his pact with Satan on the crossroads of Highway 49 and 61 in Clarksdale, Mississippi. It was at these crossroads where the legendary experiences of Johnson trading in his eternal soul for temporary fame was said to have taken place in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Well, they say you sold yourself to the devil. You know. That's what they say. I heard a lot of people say that uh, he sold himself to the devil, went to the crossroad and all that. But After Johnson's alleged pact with Satan, everything changed as Johnson went from being the worst blues guitarist in a matter of months to the best. Some musicians who knew Johnson claimed that Johnson himself admitted that he sold his soul to Satan. He said he done that, went to the crossroad. Sunhouse said that when Johnson returned after six to eight months, everything changed as Johnson was transformed almost before their very eyes. Well, then he come back. When he come back, me and Willie Brown was playing out to him, and he walked in. He said, can I, can I hit a look at him? I said, no, nah, don't come back with that, Robert. I said, you know the people don't, don't want to hear that racket. He said, that, they don't say what they want to say. I want you to see what I like. Sunhouse said when he finished, all of our mouths were standing open. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. Sunhouse declared emphatically, quote, he sold his soul to the devil to play like that.
says, and your stairway lies on the whispering wind. Backwards it says, because I live with Satan. Listen carefully. The demons lift up because this isn't Led Zeppelin. This is spiritism and spirits working through Robert Plant. Backwards, they lift up the backwards path. Backwards, it says, here's to my sweet Satan. Did you hear that? Listen carefully. It says, I want to live it backwards like the Zep, whose power is Satan. Did you hear that? Then it says, he will give you, give you 666. Raise your hands if you heard that. Okay, it's quite obvious and it's quite clear. I struggle with some of the, the lyrics from particular periods of time and I don't know, you know, uh, the musicality and the, and the construction of it is, is you know, it's peerless. But um, maybe I didn't quite feel the same about the lyrics a little bit later on in life as I got a bit further down the road. Um, so maybe I'm still trying to work out what I was talking about. <laughs> maybe you were channeling, Robert. Channeling is a good one, yeah. <laughs> Owen Glendur is, you know, <laughs> that's where it came from, yeah. We have already seen that Paige admitted I've employed Crowley's system into my own day-to-day -day life, and that is the way big names are made these days. Crowley's system was to establish contact with demons, spirits. The biography Hammer of the God states that Jimmy spent his days in his suite with his shades drawn and candles lit. He spent his days and nights wide awake, holding his guitar, waiting for something to come through. Robert Plant admitted that his reception of the song was automatic. In the occult, automatic writing takes place as a demon channels a message through the human medium. He must have written three quarters of the lyrics on the spot, said Page. He didn't have to go away and think about them. Robert Plant admitted, Page had written the chords and played them for me. I was holding the paper and pencil, and for some reason I was in a very bad mood. Then all of a sudden, I was writing out words. There's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold and she's buying a stairway to heaven. I just sat there and looked at the words, and then I almost leapt out of my seat. Stairway to Heaven is actually laced with backward satanic messages. We are talking about words that say one thing forward, and then when those same words are played backwards, there is yet another intelligent message. This satanic phenomenon goes far beyond the scope of human ingenuity and is demonically inspired. Bob Garcia of AM Records stated, quote, It must be the devil, because nobody here knows how to do it. Here we see Robert Plant, while singing Stairway to Heaven, telling his fans that sometimes words have two meanings as he signs with his hands that they are both forward and backwards. There's a sign on the wall But she wants to be sure Cause you know sometimes words have to mean The group Led Zeppelin came crashing down after the sudden and unexpected death of their drummer, John Bonham. Zeppelin, who sang about having hellhounds on their trail, met with many bizarre tragedies before their ultimate demise. In 1975, both Robert Plant and his former wife, Maureen, were severely injured in an almost fatal car accident in the island of Rhodes. Rock journalist Gary Herman in his book Rock and Roll Babylon noted the strange course of events that had come to be known as the Zeppelin Curse, picking it up in 1976. He stated, quote, It is certainly true that Led Zeppelin as a group have had a peculiarly tragic record of untimely death and severe accidents associated with themselves and their entourage. In 1976, Zepp associate Keith Harwood died in mysterious circumstances. Keith Ralph, formerly of the Yardbirds, which formed the nucleus of Zepp, committed suicide, and the wife of Zepp's road manager, Richard Cole, also died. In 1977, Robert Plant's five-year-old son, Carrick, died of a virus infection while the group was touring in America. He states that Philip Hale, a photographer, friend of Jimmy Page's, died at one of Page's homes after ingesting too much morphine, cocaine, and alcohol. And in 1980, at another of Page's houses, John Bonham met with his untimely end. 
Bonham, Led Zeppelin's drummer, like Jimi Hendrix and Bon Scott of ACDC before him, choked to death on his own vomit. According to coroner's reports, he had consumed the equivalency of 40 measures of vodka. Many of the tragedies that had befallen Led Zeppelin were in fact self-inflicted. After doctors referred to the infection that took Robert Plant's son, Carrick, as being strange and very rare, Robert Plant later said, quote, why do these terrible things keep happening? What the blank is going on? One disc jockey from Detroit believed that all these tragedies were a no-brainer and provided Plant with what he believed to be the obvious answer. He stated, quote, if Jimmy Page would just lay off all that mystical occult stuff and stop unleashing all those evil forces. Jimmy Page sought to evade what was becoming known more and more as the Led Zeppelin curse by saying, quote, a lot of negative things have occurred recently, but tragedies happen. The London Evening News ran a headline declaring Zeppelin's black magic mystery. The article reported, quote, an unnamed source close to the group commented, quote, it sounds crazy, but Robert Plant and everyone around the band is convinced that Jimmy's dabbling in black magic is responsible in some way to Bonzo's death and for all those other tragedies. I think the three remaining members of Zeppelin are now a little afraid of what's going to happen next. And uh, as we talk, uh, uh, the band leader says, how long have you fellas been involved with sorcery? <laughs> and he chalked us a little bit. And I said, exactly what do you mean? Well, he said, you know, what you people are doing, talking to the supposed spirits of the dead. He says, this is, this is, this is silly. And this man had been at the seance with you. Yeah, oh yeah. And he's telling you that it's silly what you've yeah. just done. Because see, my wife, he says, goes to the seances because she gets comfort and she gets uh, something good out of it, good feeling out of it. And she lives for what the spirits are, you know, are going to see that the future is going to be like. To me, he says, I can't bother with this stuff. He says, I want power. I go right to the source of power. And he says, how do you think that I became famous the way that I am? And I said, you must have had some good luck. Well, he says, there's no such thing as good luck. He says, there's either some power working for you somewhere, or you don't get ahead in this world. Not in my, my type of occupation. So um, it, it went from there. We, went, we got talking about uh, spirit worship. Did it intrigue you? Did it make you want to find out more about what exactly he was talking about? Yeah. So, he said the, the supposed spirits of the dead that you're talking with are demon spirits. You're fallen angels. You're beautiful beings. Just set it out, just like Oh, that. yeah. It didn't make you uneasy when he said they were Well, you know, it shocked you a little bit, you know. Something that you first hear uh, uh, mentioned to you. He said, uh, you guys have got a great future ahead of you. Because we've been told, the high priest of our society, secret society, has been told that the master has very special plans for you too. Now, what did he mean by the master? Uh, Satan. And uh, we were interested to hear more about it. And he told us, he says, look, we worship spirits. We worship Lucifer, the f Lucifer and all his angels. They're just as beautiful as they did before they were cast out of heaven. He says there was a misunderstanding in the whole thing, he says, in the, among the inhabitants of the galaxies. And he says our master was misunderstood. Your friend, George, took you and Roland to this mansion where people worshipped the demons. Mm -hmm. What was it like there? What kind of people were there? Well, it was a uh, big surprise for me. As I kind of made up my mind an idea that they were going to be rough looking characters. But as we entered the place, I was amazed to see that they were all very well dressed. 
well-mannered, and that a lot of the people, as we were in being introduced to people, were professionals, doctors, attorneys, uh, a lot of business people. And see what they had, they had a praise session to the gods, which is the uh, spirit counselors, which are in charge of legions of, of spirits, yeah. of demon spirits. And uh, they talk about what the, the Lord of their lives has done for them. The medical doctor that was telling us how he was making operations that had never been made before because people had to be al uh, awake, get, have, no, have no, no feeling. He was able to, uh, you know, carry on the surgeries that had not been done before. Mm -hmm. But the spirits would give that capacity to be able to uh, operate without people feeling uh, any pain and things. And also without uh, no problem with the, with the blood because as he would cut his incision, because the incisions, everything opened with no blood running. Mm -hmm. So you could do the work that has not been done before.